Hello, everybody. I am not Michaela Tobin. My name is Fahed Siadat. I'm the artistic director of the Resonance Collective. That's an arts organization in Los Angeles that explores the intersection between creative and spiritual practices. And it is my pleasure to collaborate with the Philosophical Research Society on tonight's event with Michaela Tobin, my uh, friend and colleague and one of my, my musical heroes. So uh, Michaela is a sound artist with a background in traditional opera. She integrates voice and electronics within the genre of noise and drone music. Her work incorporates ritualized gesture and amplified object symbolism and explores her diasporic identity as a first generation Filipina American. Michaela's voice practice is based in building connections between the physical voice as a means of empowering one's inner voice and challenging colonial stories and systems. Composing and performing primarily under the moniker White Boy Scream, Michaela dissects her operatic and extended vocal techniques through the use of electronics, oscillating between extreme textures of noise, drone, and opera operatic sound walls. Her most recent full-length album, Bakanawa, from Death Bomb Arc, includes elements of sonic ritual, ancient myth, and ancestral memory. Of the album, Steve Smith of the, the New Yorker magazine asserts that the opera would do well to pay attention, or the opera, the opera world. <laughs> the album was ranked number nine as a release of uh, 2020 in The Wire magazine. And in May 2021, Michaela premiered the cinematic adaptation of the album through Red Cat, titled Bakunawa, Opera of the Seven Moons. Currently, Michaela is in the process of creating her next opera, Apolaki, Opera of the Scorched Earth, which is set to premiere in the spring of 2023 through the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, LACE. Uh, Michaela is currently on the voice arts faculty at the California Institute of the Arts and teaches privately through her studio, Howl Space, in Los Angeles. And tonight's event is in anticipation of a performance next week where she, where she will be performing excerpts from Bakunawa and previews of sections of the new work Apulaki as part of the Resonance Collective's Golden Thread Concert Series. That's happening on uh, Saturday, December 10th at 7 p.m. at the First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. And all the tickets are pay what you can. So we hope to see you there um, next week. And without further ado, here is Michaela Tobin.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Michaela Tobin, um, and it is such an honor to be here. I wanted to activate the space with a little voice looping amplified object meditation. It's something that I do a lot in my practice, and I will talk about tonight. Um, I'd like to start the night off with some words of gratitude. I'd like to thank the Philosophical Research Society for welcoming me into such a legendary space. And I live right next door, so very convenient. Love a gig next door. Um, <laughs> it's an honor to be here tonight. Special gratitude to Fahed and everyone at the Resonance Collective for taking an interest in this work and sharing space and platform for me to present my music as part of their Golden Thread concert series next week at the beautiful First Congregational Church. Tonight, I have the pleasure of talking about the role of the ancestral voice in the work that I consider to be experimental opera. I'll be showing excerpts and sharing the history, context, and ethos behind these projects. I will leave time towards the end for questions and discussion. So before I discuss what the ancestral voice means to me, what is the voice? This brings me to a quote by um, a Filipino poet, Sai Villafuerte, um, from the Mythology of Filipino Identity, an amazing article um, that you can find online. To be truly Filipino was to be estranged, like a galleon without an anchor, drifting away with the ebb and flow of the ocean. To me, the voice is a map. It is a map home from this floating and drifting. The voice is a map of our identity. It holds the joys and the pains of our lives. It tells the story of our lineage and our positioning in the world. Our voice reveals the changes that we have with age. And um, our voice is the relationship that can tell us a lot about ourselves and our history. The voice is an instrument of empathy. It is an instrument of power. And through my practice, I have learned to love the way that my voice feels in my own body. I love using my voice in community with others, whether it be in chismis or in song, or in some cases, the best cases, both. I use my voice to sound new operatic stories. 
I use my voice to honor my family's history, to honor my heritage, and to ask questions big and small. I use my voice, my voice to soothe. I use my voice as a form of meditation, and at times to make noise and to boldly, to loudly take up space. I even teach a class called Learning to Scream. <laughs> I use my voice as an affirmation that I exist, that I matter, and that I cannot be erased. And a big part of my practice is helping others do the same. So what is the ancestral voice? I think that's different for everyone. But to me, the ancestral voice is both literal and figurative. My voice represents the lineage of generations that have come before me and the generations that will come after me, my future ancestors. I am the meeting point of my past and my future ancestors. We all are. As an artist, I feel called to excavate and understand the history of my own mixed Filipino-American heritage and how the historical trauma of being colonized still plays out in our present-day communities, both in the Philippines and in the diaspora. I feel that the ancestral voice calls me to recognize, transmute, and find healing from the traumas through this work. In fact, a really big influence on my work um, is a thesis by Joanna Latore um, called Decolonizing and Reindigenizing Filipinos in Diaspora. Um, I read this thesis, I found it online, and it really um, influenced a lot of the work and ethos behind what I'm, what, I, what I'm currently doing. I'll read this one quote from the essay and um, talk to me after. I'd be happy to um, share it with you. She's amazing as well. I, I ended up reaching out to her after I um, read her thesis, and she's really lovely. Colonized people, like Filipinos, experience psychological and um, physical consequences resulting from processes of colonization, including physical, spiritual, and episte epistemic violence. Scholars developed frameworks such as historical trauma and colonial mentality to understand these harms, which pass from generation to generation of catastrophic and intentional violence that disrupts communal, familial, and individual health. Filipino Americans experiencing mental and health disparities linked to these um, have higher rates of depression than Asian and white Americans, and nearly half of Filipino Filipina adolescents experience suicidal ideation compared with 13% of high school students. So the information in this thesis really informs a lot of the, um, my, the, the fuel behind my practice. <clears throat> The ancestral voice is the burning desire within me to tell these stories, to reimagine them, and to bring them into our present day. I feel driven to create the thing that I see missing from the world around me. I am driven to create work that tells a forgotten story. I believe that all of our voices and our stories are woven together like strong palm leaf. And I am but one small part of that intricate pattern. The stories are rather the voices of our ancestors, are our voices, and our stories will be our future ancestors' stories. My voice and the noise I make is a declaration that we as a people are still here. It is a call to the past and a prayer to the future. In my work, the ancestral voice not only comes across through the sounds I make with my voice, but also through the layers of symbols, objects, and imagery. These are the charms I create to honor where I come from and create the future that I want to see. So a little bit about the history of my practice and kind of my relationship to voice and heritage. I was born and raised in Pasadena, California, um, in the foothills. And I'm of Filipino descent. My mother um, was born and raised in Manila. And my father um, was born in the States. So I am half Filipino and half white. And I grew up singing in church, um, in church choirs. I grew up singing in my grandmother's church, um, Rosewood Methodist on Vermont, a very large Filipino congregation. Um, and my grandmother, my mother's mother, was the oldest of six sisters who all sang. And so I have early memories of everyone singing in church and the sisters here singing in church choir. 
and um, experiencing culture through, experiencing the music of my culture through the lens of the church. I went to the arts high school here, I studied opera, and then I went to UCLA to study um, opera, traditional opera at UCLA. And then after that, I felt a bit isolated from the classical practice. I moved to Seattle. That's when I started getting into noise and experimental music, um, a kind of a kind of a jumping into the abyss, if you will. That's where I connected with the DIY noise scene. I played a lot of basement shows, um, and I really learned a lot up there. And I'm really grateful for my time spent in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in 2013, I visited the Philippines for the first time. I went home. Um, with my mother and her sister, and it was their first time back since they immigrated and my very first time being there, and that really changed the course of how I thought about my identity and also my practice. In 2016, I came back to LA and I went to CalArts um, for my master's, and I'm still there teaching today. Um, it was there that I started to imagine a new kind of opera, um, combining my noise practice with um, my operatic voice, and began to think about creating more large-scale um, interdisciplinary performances that I would call opera. Someone that was also a really big influence on my practice is um, my ate, or my older, that's an older, older sister in Tagalog, um, in my community, Ana Luisa Patrisco. Um, I first saw she was making um, experimental opera, um, tropical pop. She's an amazing video artist, interdisciplinary dancer, singer, musician. And um, I saw her show Olinglingo at Human Resources in, I believe, around 2000, right when I was starting CalArts, so around 2015, 16. Um, and it was an experimental opera. And a scene from it deconstructed a Filipino lullaby. And it was a really powerful experience for me um, because in that moment, I just began weeping. And I didn't, I didn't know why I was even weeping, but I had such a visceral reaction to watching this Filipino lullaby, same one called Bahai Kubo. Um, I'm sure if there's any Filipinos in the room, you know it. Um, it was a lullaby that my grandfather and I used to sing together. Um, and seeing that on stage through this experimental lens changed me, um, and I realized that I'd never seen my culture reflected back to me on stage before. Um, through the many years of study that I had done opera, uh, Western opera, I had, yeah, I had never experienced this feeling that I did at that performance, and I, it was a bit heartbreaking because you don't realize what you're missing or that you're missing in the world until you're faced with it, until someone else shows you yourself. And, um, that was a really profound artistic experience for me. And so I wanted to share that with you um, because Ana Luisa, to this day, we've gone on. After that show, I, I went up to her after the show with tears in my eyes and I said, I need to work with you. Um, I'm also half Filipino. I'm confused in the world. And I, you know, you seem like an ally and I adore you. And we ended up um, collaborating and making a show called Body Ship that we toured around the uh, American Southwest that was um, about two sisters retracing Magellan's route on the cosmos. Um, all right. So where am I now? So now I am into making new mythology. Um, I really want to honor my family's stories. I'm creating community and connection, and I'm also teaching. Um, I have a, I have also have a private studio in LA where I um, develop vocal, my vocal practice, and I share my vocal practice with people with another amazing colleague of mine, Carmina Escobar, and it's actually right next door because we live next door. Um, but yeah, Hal Space is where I really connect my voice and the empowerment of learning to love my voice into my teaching practice and helping marginalized voices find their true resonance. So I'm going to start going into my work. Um, oh, yes, OK. So there were a lot of limitations of the traditional operatic canon. Um, I found myself disillusioned and disempowered in the rat race of it all. Um, there were a lot of limitations to the Eurocentricity of you know, these very dated storylines um, and casting. And I felt like it put me in a box. 
So, and I, yet I was supposed to dedicate my life to it. So my pivot away from opera into experimental opera was very empowering, and I began to use free improvisation as a way of owning my own voice, owning, finding agency within my own body, um, and freedom from kind of these, the very limited aesthetic of operatic singing. Um, although I really appreciate and love the training that I received in the discipline, and I enjoy the feeling of the operatic voice in the body because it is such a big, beautiful instrument, and you're really using the entire cavity to create such strong, um, reverberation in the room and and it's very an it's a, again an instrument of empathy and people can feel it um, in their own bodies but I really realized that for much of my upbringing and experience in opera I was really making sounds for other people um, I was I was trying to please the ears of my teachers of my directors of the audience and I never really um, cared about or was really connected to how the voice feels within my own body so that's really what a lot of my own vo vocal practice is and what comes across in my music is really just me enjoying the, the feeling of my voice in my own body. And when I'm working with others, that's what I try to do as well. I try to help you find, I try to help you enjoy the feeling of your voice in your body because I think uh, the majority of people don't enjoy the sound of their own voice, both sonically but also um, physically. I use a lot of electronics in my work as well. Um, I do a whole other lecture on the amplified voice, but just briefly, because this will go into, when I go into the operas, um, I use a lot of electronics as well um, as on top of free improvisation. Um, electronics and amplifying my voice um, encourages me to take up sonic space. My exploration with noise music really helped me to activate myself in a way that I had never, you know, in in other situations have felt smaller or, sub or subservient. When I can scream loudly and amplify my voice and use distortion pedals and use all of these kind of non-beautiful aesthetics, I find a freedom in that um, and a power that I haven't found in other um, art forms. <clears throat> I use a lot of looping in my practice as well as you saw in the beginning. Um, Looping, I feel, is an active, another form of activating the ancestral voice. Looping, to me, is a form of meditation. It's a, the way that I learn to enjoy the sound of my own voice. Um, I think it's also a great practice in terms of developing harmony and developing one's ear. I also think symbolically, um, looping is a way that you have to deal with yourself and you have to deal with the imperfections of your voice because they get recorded immediately into this chain into this into this circle that you have to build upon and respond to in real time so i that's why i use looping um, in my practice a lot and i encourage a lot of my students to do the same when we're working with electronics um, because to me it's a very deep form of sonic meditation I also use a lot of field recordings um, in my work. I am, field recordings allow me to bring in other times and places, um, even if they're barely heard. Uh, conversations oftentimes, um, there's a recording even of my own mother that opens the record that I'll get into later. Um, and I love to create kind of these secret containers through which the music is being heard. Um, I feel that those times and places are really integral to creating a sonic palette that is bigger than just notes on paper. So this brings me to my project, White Boy Scream, through which I developed these two operas that I'll be speaking about. Um, White Boy Scream has been a project for about 10 years. After I saw Ana Luisa's opera and visited the Philippines, I began to think about my own heritage more and my positioning, um, my own positioning of, of these dynamics within me. And I created a record called um, Thou. Um, and I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about the imagery and the symbolism here. So Thou, the first track on it, is a deconstruction of my grandmother's favorite hymn called uh, How Great Thou Art. And I deconstruct it sonically using two contact microphones, um, distortion pedal, um, and the imagery for it, and I'll show the the, a little bit of the music video, but the imagery of me painted purple is to represent um, ube, which is a purple root found in traditional Filipino food. 
And for me, um, also being mixed, I never feel, felt that I was, I looked Filipino. Um, you could never quite place me. And so I wanted to imagine that my, my roots, my literal roots, the ube root was um, oozing out of my skin and turning me purple. And that was the way that I felt like I felt really activated um, and um, in my own heritage. Let me see, okay, this is where it gets a little, my PowerPoint gets a little sloppy, so bear with me. I have to exit this and then so I could show you. The music video, oh, maybe I can do this. No, okay. And I'm gonna play this, but we could maybe turn it down a little bit because I'm gonna speak over it. So in this music video, um, I'm a top of all dress um, and I'm covered in pearls to represent the pearl of the Orient, um, which is a phrase that is used to describe the Philippines. Um, it's a mixed bag, that phrase. It can both be seen as a compliment, but also, um, also as a This dress also represents the opera singer and the classical opera singer. that on my links, but uh, I want to keep it moving here. Okay. So that was the first, I think, ancestral voice that I've found in my work. Uh, fast forward to 2020, uh, the pandemic hit, and I had the opportunity to do a residency at Coaxial Arts Foundation. We love Coaxial. Um, I decided to do a series of videos um, with their blue screen called Sonic Rituals for Decolonizing the Ancestral Voice um, or Almost Songs of the Bakunawa. And this is a precursor to the Bakunawa story that I'll get to. Um, I did three nights. I did, on the first night, I did um, songs for my grandmother. So it was a series of Kundiman um, songs. And Kundiman, for those that don't know, um, Kundiman are Filipino folk songs um, originating in an oral tradition. Um, they became strongly associated with the Philippine Revolution and with nationalism. Um, and singing Kundiman for me is a way that I literally can connect with my ancestral voice. Um, I have sheet music of Kundiman from my grandmother and my great grandmother, and notes on it saying, "This, you know, this is this was your grandmother's favorite song." And so, for my whole life, I've been asked to sing Kundiman, and it was always this thing that was separate from my art practice and something that I would like do at church or do at family gatherings. And so, I felt like I really wanted to to connect this and bring this into, you know, break down all the walls or the perceived walls between these different parts of my identity and my life. And really, and really um, showcase and and celebrate um, these things. So, this is a really nice quote um, about Kundiman. Throughout the years, the Kundiman, by its musical sound and text, encapsulates the essence of the Filipino history and character. It is a most heartfelt song to which Filipinos pour their deep profession of devotion and aspiration. And I'm going to play a little of that. And there's a lot of um, different symbolism that you'll see. Where is it? Where did I put it? Here, okay. So I'll play a little of the Kundiman. Again, I'm in the white dress. It's kind of a thread in my work. Um, Madalena Rao is one of her favorite Kundimans. My dear friend and collaborator, Ria Fowler, um, arranged the story. 
strings and uh, uh, arranged and performed all the string parts. I'm holding the, the, green, the blue screen in the background, and because this is kind of one of the, the interesting parts of responding to the limitations of the pandemic, um, I was in touch with my cousin in Pai Thai, who lives on our family land in Pai Thai as well. Another part of this practice, or these, these video pieces that I did, is I started each, the first two nights with a dance. Um, my grandmother taught Filipino folk dance, and so during the pandemic, um, I was up, and I'd never done it before. So I decided to look at different dances in the book and try and do them myself. Also to these dances, so I sent that sheet to collaborator and Filipino, um, Filipino American artist who played who deconstructed the shows. background imagery of interlacing imagery from Tai Tai Rizal and my mother's garden um, because I wanted to picture of the folk dances there's like a little sticker for <laughs> or stick my grandmother's sticker <laughs> bugs funny I guess um, this is this is a, a screenshot and I wanted to show I filmed my parents standing in the backyard waving and then that became part of the blue screen and was going back and forth um, I just think they're so cute all right so this brings me to the album that I based the first film off of so Bakunawa. Bakunawa is a sonic bridge to my motherland. Um, the album is a sonic retelling of the story of the Bakunawa. The Bakunawa was a moon-eating serpent, um, a pre-colonial mythological creature of the Philippines. Um, and the Bakunawa, the story goes that the Bakunawa rose from the ocean mesmerized by the light of the seven moons in the sky. Bakunawa ate six of them, and upon engulfing the seventh, the people came out and started banging on metal and making noise and calling for the Bakunawa to leave the seventh moon or give the seventh moon back in the sky. And the Bakunawa d does, and it's uh, the creation story of the first lunar eclipse. I found this story on an online archive of pre-colonial Philippine myths, and it stuck with me. Um, and I guess you could say it was one of those light bulb aha moments. And I became completely obsessed with it. So this is the album art um, for the Bakunawa. As you can see, I um, am inhabiting the role of the Bakunawa, or I'm turning in. I'm, I'm sitting here on a peacock throne. A peacock throne is um, kind of a famous chair that's made in the Philippines um, that became famous um, in the States, first like in silent film era, and then um, the Black Panthers famously um, 
have a lot of photos showing um, love the peacock thrones. Um, and one day, hopefully, I'll own one too. Um, <laughs> that's for the big, big budget opera. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of charged objects in this photo as well. Um, my grandmother's jewelry is hanging. Um, there's shells that I got in from the Philippines. Um, Katie Stenberg, who's my director of photography for the film, did the um, did the whole design for this with me, and she um, built out this set in her driveway. Um, and so I'm out there at two in the morning in the freezing cold, naked, uh, holding a eating moon rock. No. <laughs> Um, this was an homage to my great-grandmother, um, Lena Salta, and you can see her here sitting on her peacock throne in my grandmother's house. Um, Lena was born in Bulacan, the, in Bulacan region of the Philippines, and um, as you can see, here's a close-up. I also um, wanted to um, use black and teeth um, on the, on, in the album, and when I'm activating this music, um, it's a pre-colonial um, kind of something that we used to do pre-colonization was blacken our teeth with like burnt coconut husks um, as a sign of our power and humanity. And so I wanted to bring that back. There are a few tribes in the southern Philippines that still practice this, but it was, it was, it was a practice that was decimated by the arrival of the Spanish. So I, th I wanted to honor that that pre-colonial practice um, in the artwork for the album. Um, on the right, my left, your right, you can see um, this inlet pattern made by, um, designed by Nicanor Evangelista Jr., who also will make an appearance in the film. Um, Nicanor specializes in um, indigenous Filipino tattooing. And we, he created this pattern with me based on, based on my heritage, based on the region that my great-grandmother is from. Um, and I include it in some of the artwork. Um, it's interlaced in the artwork and as well as on my arm. So that's a very powerful symbol for me. All right. Um, before I go to that, I do want to talk about a couple of musical elements um, that I use on the record that also made it into the opera. So I use an amplified Walis Tambo, which is Again, going back to my ritualized, my amplified object symbolism. Um, I amplify a walis tambo, which is a type of Filipino broom to create a lot of harsh noise. You heard a little of it in the beginning of this. Um, the album also opens with a poem read by my mother in Tagalog. It's a poem that I wrote about the Bakunawa. And I asked my mother to translate it and, into Tagalog because I don't speak Tagalog fluently. Um, and when she sent me back a phone recording of her speaking it, I just decided, I asked her and I said, Can, I just want your voice on the album um, speaking, speaking this poem. Um, and that's really important for me to, every time I activate this, this project and this music, to have my mother's voice be the first voice that you hear in the space is important. Um, in the album, there's a lot, I use a lot of tinikling um, bamboo rhythms. Tinikling is a type of folk, Filipino folk dance with these big bamboo um, poles that, you, that they, you slap together in rhythm, and there's dancers um, that dance in between them. Um, a song on the record is also based off of Between Marikit, which is one of the kundimans that I sang earlier. Um, and so I kind of recontextualized the song and I took the lyrics and turned it into a new song on the record and it's kind of my love song to the Philippines. So that brings me to the film, Bakunawa, Opera of the Seven Moons. Um, this film came about, again, because of the pandemic. Um, as an improviser myself, I feel a duty to respond to the limitations and shifting parameters of my reality. So when Red Cat approached me in late 2020, asking if I'd want to do something for their spring programming, um, you know, I'd always thought the story of the Bakunawa would make a great opera. And I thought, well, since we're not doing live performances, let's make an opera film. Um, and so Katie Stenberg and I set out to make a film. And I'm going to show you um, excerpts from it as well. So I dedicated this, um, this film, it's dedicated to my ancestors and their myths, may they never be erased. 
This opera is a sonic reclamation of the stories that colonizers violently stole and attempted to erase from my ancestors for centuries. Centering the mythology of the Philippines in an artist arena that has been traditionally Eurocentric is a ritualized act of healing. This operatic ritual blends musical genres and site-specific performance practice as a way to connect to my motherland across the diaspora, creating a sonic bridge from the California coast across the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. Um, here's my amazing production and creative team. I'll say all the names, but you can read them. <laughs> um, and these are the lists of scenes. I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna go through some of them and talk about some of the symbolism. Um, I wanna show a little bit of the first of the prologue. And I'm gonna talk a little over it. Perlas ng silangan, perlas so ng kalangitan. Kapag ikay pinag-ari ko, may pag-asa ba ako sa liwanag? Perlas ng silangan, perlas sa kalangitan. Ako si Bakunawa, tatakupin ko ang akin. Bakunawa, Bakunawa, sabik sa ilaw. Bakunawa, mula sa kailaliman ng dagat. Tumakas sa kagabihan. The amplified while is tumble. Is that sweeping sound? Perlas ng silangan, perlas ng kalangitan. Kapag ikay pinag-ari ko, may pagkakaba ako sa luwanan. Perlas ng silangan, perlas sa kalangitan. At sa bakunawa, tatakutin ko ang akin. Bakunawa, bakunawa, sabik sa ilaw. Bakunawa, mula sa kailalim ng mga tumakas sa kagabihan. Patria played our Babaylan. Babaylan is a Filipino. Perlas ng silangan. Perlas ng kalangitan. Kapag ikay binagari ko, may pag-asa ba ako sa liwanan? Perlas ng silangan. Perlas sa kalangitan. Ako si Bakunawa. Tatakutin ko ang akin. Bakunawa, Bakunawa. Sabik sa ilaw. Bakunawa. Mula sa kapit sa mga dagat. The dress I'm wearing is made of piña cloth. Um, some of it is my grandmother's cloth. Others were uh, reappropriated barangs, which are traditional Filipino shirts. Making art about the chaos of the 
being in the pandemic, I, we would like sit six feet apart, like moving in the park and yelling at each other. Um, and she's a beautiful friend. And at the end, I become a the yellow roses are um, an acknowledgement. They're my grandmother's favorite rose. So I have yellow roses as a symbol of my work. You can hear the strings mimicking the sound of the symphony. Perfect. And I will pause it there. Um, the film is not yet online for streaming. It's been in uh, some film festivals, but I will make it available. Um, you're welcome to email me privately if you'd like a private screener. I'm happy to share that with people. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the symbolism and the ancestral voice throughout this work. Um, in the moon aria, so this is a picture of me from the devouring scene, but the moon aria, um, is the next scene, and it is the only element of operatic singing that is present in the film, both on the album and in the film. Um, it takes place within the opera wall, in the confines of the institution or the, the um, theater. Um, we filmed it in Red Cat. And musically, I quote uh, Rizalka's Song to the Moon by Dvorak. Um, I wanted to pay homage to the, op my, the operatic tradition that I also come from, and I felt like that was a nice, a nice way to connect the two arias. Um, the, scene, the next scene is the devouring scene, which this is a still from, where I devour the six moons um, that were beautiful light sculptures made by Kirsten, uh, lighting designer Kirsten Hovland. Um, the devouring scene is a, a scene that's really the only, um, it's a dance with these sculptures, and the harsh noise in it is, again, the, the emergence of the, the amplified Walis Tambo, and um, strings by Rhea Fowler. And then we go to, well, this isn't, well, we go to the community scene, which is um, when we're suddenly outside, and I wanted to bring the opera from the kind of institutional, um, Theater or opera house. Okay, the original version I wanted to rent. I wanted to rent um, the opera house downtown because there was no operas happening there during the pandemic. So I thought, why could we film a Dorothy Chandler stage for a day? But it was a bit out of my budget for this <laughs> for this round. Uh, it turns out, so we filmed in Red Cat, which was extremely lovely. But I wanted to. The symbolism originally was to feel that Bakunawa began in the confines of an opera house and then burst out onto the shore, if you will. Um, in the community scene, and I do want to show an excerpt of this, um, the community scene is the only scene in the opera where we, we used live sound and singing. Um, two wonderful musicians joined me, um, uh, Nicanor and Dion, who play the agong, which is a traditional Filipino um, gong. And let me go back to it. And I'll show. Tambo returning as a symbol, as a uh, charged object. Um, I also like the idea of sweeping sand. Play 
choreography by Patria. Um, with collaboration from Jay Carlon, who's going to be in the next one. It's a very slowed down version of this Filipino folk dance um, called the Pandango. Um, it's a Filipino folk dance that was from the Spanish, um, derived from the Spanish. Um, but in our version, um, I, wanted, I wanted it to be a, um, a, a dance where we're reclaiming our light and we're giving the candles to each other. Really, another big part of the opera um, was this call for love letters from the community, and this also has a lot to do with um, family, my family lineage and history. Um, 
aside from the fact that I feel like there's, it, it is um, this, I, in the work that I make, I want to include community voice somehow. Um, it, it feels very important to me that the work isn't just about like a sole person or about my own identity or experience, but that I can kind of share that and lift others up in the same way. And I think it goes back to this Filipino sense of kapwa, which is community and family, and that we are all one together and connected. Um, so during the making of the opera, I put a call out to the community um, for love letters to be woven into the sonic and material fabric of the opera. And this was the um, prompt for people. Write a love letter to yourself, to someone you miss, to your community, to a stranger, Write a love letter to our collective grief, to our collective joy, to our collective unconscious. Write a love letter to your ancestors, to your future ancestors. Write a love letter to your chosen family. Write a love letter to someone you've forgotten, to someone unseen. Write a love letter to someone you haven't met yet, to the you you haven't met yet. Write a love letter to the person you're leaving behind. Write a love letter to the person you want to be. And I sent this call out. And the reason why I sent this call out is because there is a particular story um, about my grandmother, my grandmother and my grandfather that my mother told me that really hit, like really made my heart hurt. Um, when my and I will share it with you all tonight. Um, when my grandmother was, when my grandmother was immigrating to the United States, um, I'll back up. My grandparents were separated for almost a decade because my grandfather um, was working um, during the Vietnam War as um, a medic driver. So he would only come home one month out of the year for almost 10 years. Um, a lot of Filipinos have to work outside of the home, outside of their country, away from their family for extended periods of time, doing all sorts of work all around the world. So it was quite normal. They would write love letters to each other while they were gone, um, back and forth. And by the time after the war and by the time they were ready to immigrate to the States, my grandmother had a suitcase full of these letters. She could not bring that suitcase with her. Um, there was just too much stuff. And so my mother has a memory of watching my grandmother burn these letters in a bonfire in her backyard. Um, and so I wanted to honor that that scene and that, that you know, I, I feel like that is such a representation for so many of us um, who are first generation of the sacrifices that our families made to get us here um, and to get us to where we are now. So I wanted to honor that sacrifice um, through this art. And so I put this call out and the letters that I received from people were just, I received physical letters, I received collages, I received voice memos and um, for the 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 sec the uh, one two three four five the sixth scene of the opera the um, palayain um, which means freeing to to free oneself or to to be, to be freed um, it's a scene in the opera where Bakunawa free sets the moon free and the first so, uh, lunar eclipse is born in that scene we burn the love letters um, that were sent to us and I had everyone on my cast and my crew um, write a love letter also while we were filming. And we did a ceremony of burning these love letters um, in the fire. So the last letter, and it was the letter, the first letter and the last letter. So the letter I'm holding in the first scene is the last letter we burn in the scene. And it was a letter that my mother wrote to her grandmother um, because I also sent this prompt to my family. And she gave me uh, the letter, I think it was the night before we went to go film. And um, I won't say what's in it. Um, it's very personal to our family, but it really was this beautiful charged um, object and it felt like such an honor to have that be a part of the of the piece and I really felt that the ancestors were with us when we were doing that um, so I will show a little of what that looked like this is the only this is the scene in the opera um, where there's a lot of drones um, my electronic drones and then looping of the voice again <laughs>
this song called Love Letters. Um, it's a kind of a standard by Edward Heyman and uh, Victor Young. And it's a song that is really important to my family. I sang it at both of my grandparents' funerals um, and probably every family event since I was little. Um, and so I wanted to end this opera with this song. Um, the music itself is not, is not experimental. Um, we wanted, Rhea did the, uh, again, the string arrangements for this song. And it's almost kind of my Disney princess moment at the end of the opera <laughs> with the waves hitting me. But I wanted it to be um, in the, the musical voice that my grandparents, you know, listened to this song and, and I wanted to honor them. And it was my way of really bringing in the gamut of sonic styles and genres that make up you know, that make up the ancestral voice, that make up who, who I am and what this piece is. And um, it was really, really important. And I'll play a little of this and then I'm gonna move on. But I did wanna show things move on again let me know if you'd like to see a private screener I do have one um, otherwise in the next year it'll be on the interwebs so that was Bakunawa opera of the seven moons um, it was a really powerful experience I think a challenge of making a film is that you it's so tedious that oftentimes you don't feel like you're maybe in the pro you're not you're not able to kind of be present with the performance but something really amazing about not only the challenge of filming this during a pandemic, but also kind of just the location and the timing and the weather and everything. But in that moment at you know, 2 a.m., 50 degrees outside, I'm singing my grandparents' love song to the full moon on the ocean. Um, to me, that was one of the most powerful artistic experiences and just, yeah, ancestral experiences that I, I, I've ever had. So I'm really grateful um, to everyone on that team that made that happen. Um, it's very special. I watched this first. I didn't tell my, my mother that I was including this song until she saw it and we watched it at home. And it was a really emotional experience for both of us. And uh, my family really loves this scene and, and the fact that this song exists in this, in this arena. So that brings me to now. What am I doing now? Well. Now, ah, brings me to the next opera, Apolaki, Opera of the Scorched Earth. 
This um, Apolaki was a track on the Bakunawa record. Apolaki is the pre-colonial god of sun and war, who all has his own story. And I wanted to, um, I also wanted to make an opera about him. So while I was making Bakunawa, I got the opportunity um, to um, make the film. I mean, make the next opera, make this. Um, and so the planning began. Um, it's going to be set to premiere in June 2023. And I'll give more info about that. But before I get ahead of myself, so this, the idea of this opera is based off of this quote. I weep to see the completion of what I expected for many years, namely that you would welcome some foreigners with white teeth and hooded heads who would implant amidst your house's crossed poles to torment me all the more. I am leaving you to seek people who follow me, for you have abandoned me, your ancient lord, for foreigners. And this is a passage um, that someone wrote kind of based from the, idea, from the, the perspective of Apolaki leaving the Philippines or being displaced from the Philippines um, because of Spanish colonization and the way that, you know, we lost, that was the point that we lost a lot of our, of our um, stories, of our identity, um, our pre-colonial identity. Um, and so I felt really drawn to kind of build a story and an opera to, around Apolaki. Again, Apolaki is the god of sun and war. Um, in, in this story, in my opera, Apolaki is displaced from the Philippines due to colonial invasion and subsequent erasure. Apolaki then finds themselves in the middle of the Mojave Desert, lost and alone. They must make a new home, but on whose land? So this piece is meant to bring up questions about land ownership, um, colonial settlers, displacement, immigration, decolonization, land repatriation, et cetera. The list can go on. Climate, you know, climate change. Um, in this opera, Apolaki begins in the desert and starts a pilgrimage around Southern California for now, but I, was, I would like to see the work expanded to other areas. But be, has this, begins this pilgrimage looking for a new home, but then realizes that the, the land that we're on here is stolen. And we don't really have, no one has the right to own it or to, or I guess it really poses the question, who has the right to make, to make a new home here and to call it home? What is home? Um, and how do we navigate the complexities of being settlers um, here that, uh, for those of us whose ancestors were displaced? Um, the creative team that I will be, that I'll have on this project, Jay Carlone is going to activate um, the body of Apolaki. Um, and Carlo Maghirang is going to be doing the environmental set design. Uh, so it's a Filipino creative team, which I'm really excited about. Um, the three of us have worked um, in different capacities together before, and we're going to embark on this new adventure together. So the locations, I imagine the first, there'll be three performances. The structure of this opera, there'll be three performances. The first one, I imagine Apalaki in the desert at sunrise. Um, it'll be a sunrise performance or activation. And then Apolaki, well, numbers are off. Uh, the Mount will make, make their way to the mountains, perhaps Mount Wilson Observatory or somewhere in the mountains. I grew up, personally, I grew up in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, so um, I want to connect. Um, I want to make a connection and do an activation somewhere in the foothills. And then the third location will be some sort of urban landscape in Los Angeles, and that'll be a sunset performance. Um, in this opera, the main thing that I'm going to be using are labyrinths. So actually, upon um, looking, I've talked a lot about looking at my Filipino heritage. I also, you know, I am half white, and I do have um, ancestors from Ireland and Germany, and I was reading on, up on, like, Irish stuff. <laughs> And I came upon um, the imagery of the labyrinth. And I'm like, wow, what is this? And I started doing more research. It's all still very new. But um, kind of found that these walking labyrinths, or the imagery of the labyrinth, has been around not just in Europe, but all over the world. And it's this ancient, ancient form. And it's used as like this walking meditation. Um, a labyrinth is different from a maze. A labyrinth has one entrance in and one entrance out. And it's used as like this symbolic um, meditation, meditation. You, you, you walk and you think and 
Um, it's really amazing. And so these are, I've been reading about labyrinths, and these are a couple quotes from my labyrinth research um, that I think relate to Apollaki's journey. Um, Does the pilgrim's journey ever end? Perhaps not as long as we traverse this earthly plane. Pilgrims are people in motion, passing through territories not their own, seeking something we might call completion, clarity, a goal to which only the spirit's compass points the way. So my vision for, for Apollaki for the opera, for the final performance, is to build a labyrinth um, with Carlo and for Apollaki and the audience to walk this labyrinth. Um, I want to play with ideas of reimagining the shape of a labyrinth. This is a very classical shape um, from Europe, and I'm wondering if there are ways um, through which you know, Carlo and I can reimagine what the, this pattern and shape might be and how we can connect that to Filipino identity and symbols found in the Philippines and pre-colonial Philippines. So you're seeing this before Carlo's seeing this. <laughs> Um, a little more in the labyrinth. The labyrinth as a walking meditation. Um, this is a picture of me. I just visited um, Tucson, and um, they have a really, there's a really beautiful labyrinth there in one of their park, one of the national parks. Um, so I had a really profound experience with that. The labyrinth as a walking meditation is a symbolic gesture of immigration, of displacement, searching for a new home, trying to connect to source. Walking is the main driving force of the opera. Both Apalaki and audience members will walk the labyrinth path. Um, so that's where I'm at with this idea of the labyrinth. Um, the musical themes for the opera, and some which you'll hear in the concert next week, um, it's going to be drone-based material this time around, um, really slow and heavy. I keep thinking about mimicking the geology of time um, through subtle, patient musical gestures. Right now, I'm using percussion and voice with electronics. Um, next week, the concert, I'll be joined by Adam Starkoff, um, who is a wonderful drummer. The music scores are going to be based on labyrinth patterns and numerology right now. Um, and I imagine for the final production that Apollaki will actually conduct the music with their own movement um, based on the pattern and the pacing of their walking. Um, I'm also reading a really interesting book right now called Thinking About Counterpoint as a, um, sorry, Colonial Counterpoint, um, Music in Early Modern Manila. And so it's a book that talks about how counterpoint as a musical form is used as a form of control in colonialism um, through Spanish, through the music of the church. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to use some counterpoint in some way as a form of abstraction in, in, in the opera. Um, this is a little kind of score that Adam and I are using next week. Um, just So the 13-pointed star is one of the designs based off of um, these classic labyrinths found in Europe. And so I'm assigning pitches to the different points, and we're using different pitch clusters to kind of create this labyrinth pattern um, in music. Um, today, what you saw, what I did earlier, I'm also using rice as a texture, as a sound material. Um, amplified sprinkling of rice, perhaps a trail of rice like breadcrumbs. Um, there's something about um, these kind of sand mandalas made of rice that relate that that relate to the labyrinth for me. So I'm going to be exploring that. And um, it's interesting. It's something that Jay and I really connected on. Jay just finished um, his own piece at, at Red Cat titled Novena, um, in which he um, dragged a 50-pound bag of rice and filled it into a punching bag and did this beautiful dance with the punching bag. And um, I did the sound design for that. So both of us feel really connected to rice's material. I think for me, sonically, um, because rice is used in a lot of new music as like this extra texture um, that's like devoid of any kind of connection to what it actually is. This is my way of reclaiming rice in new music. Um, so also for the upcoming concert um, on December 10th, another really great element I'm going to include, um, I'm going to be singing with my, one of my grandmother's sisters, um, and we're going to be singing a kundiman together to open the concert. Um, and my aunt, who has been a church pianist in Los Angeles at the Filipino church, uh, the Filipino congregation, first at Rosewood and now in Walnut, Filipino method, uh, Walnut Methodist Church is going to be playing piano for us. And I felt that 
because I have such the amazing opportunity to activate you know, the, cathe the uh, First Congregational Church, this huge cathedral has the world's largest organ. It's this amazing, beautiful space. And because I grew up in the church, I wanted to bring the women, the family members, my elders that you know, taught me how to do this or taught me, first exposed me to singing and music. I really wanted to bring them um, into the space with me to start the concert. So um, it's good. It's a surprise for everyone else, but everyone here listening online knows that I have two other special guests joining me. Um, I would like to thank also, oop, I've missed my notes on this. Before I end tonight, and I leave some time for questions, I do want to give, again, deep gratitude to uh, the Philosophical Research Society, to the Resonance Collective, also to um, the MAP Fund and the NPN Fund and LACE and um, Outsider Fest um, for supporting the, this new work, for supporting Apolaki. If it wasn't for all of them, it wouldn't be happening. Um, so yeah, come see me, come see us December 10th, and then watch out for us. It will be premiering in June of 2023 in a desert near you. Thank you so much. <laughs>